Hello everyone, we are going to begin the dinosaur phylogeny series by examining the humble beginnings of dinosaurs at the base of their phylogenetic tree. And to make sure that we understand exactly what dinosaurs are, we'll also take a quick look at the evolution of their ancestors, starting with the first amniotes. So let's jump right in. <laughs> Despite the fact that dinosaurs are the paleo superstars of pop culture, most people are confused about what a dinosaur is supposed to be. When they look at things like Triceratops and T-Rex, which don't look like each other at all, it is difficult to see what they have in common that makes them dinosaurs, other than being big, reptilian, and extinct. As a result, many other extinct reptiles are often mistaken for dinosaurs, such as ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs, and pterosaurs. Even the massive mosasaurs, like the grossly oversized one featured in Jurassic World, are actually just lizards, members of the clade Squamata. Before this gets too confusing, let's start with a parent clade that's close enough to our target organisms and follow the lineage towards them in simple steps. So we'll begin with the clade of amniotes, which are defined as terrestrial vertebrates who reproduce via an amniotic egg or sac. This was an important adaptation for living on dry land, becoming less dependent on water for laying their eggs, like amphibians still are. Amniotes first appeared during the Carboniferous period, and they quickly divided into many groups. To summarize, the main daughter clades of amniotes are anapsids, synapsids, and diapsids. These are defined by the number of temporal fenestrae, the holes where jaw muscles attach, in their skulls. However, the number of holes sometimes vary within lineages by losing or gaining new ones. Despite the fact that these groups are currently very different from each other, during the Carboniferous period their respective ancestors would all look like lizards to the untrained eye. Back then they were still closely related enough such that the temporal fenestra was one of the few traits that made them distinct from each other. For starters, synapsids, having one hole in the skull, include the mammals of today, but also the ancient mammal-like therapsids and reptile-like pelicosaurs. Second, the anapsids, or parareptiles, are an extinct group of amniotes that existed from the late Carboniferous to the Triassic, and are identified by having no holes in their skulls. Traditionally, turtles were classed among the anapsids, being either more closely related to pereosaurs or procolophonids, but this conclusion has been upset by more recent molecular and fossil data. Instead, it would appear turtles fall within the diapsids. Turtles could really have a whole video unto themselves. However, we're not here to talk about any of them, we're here to talk about the dinosaur ancestors. Dinosaurs and their ancestors fall within the clade of diapsids, the amniotes having two holes in their skull. Diapsids and their relatives and anapsids unite to form the clade Sauropsida, and previously Diapsida contained all the Sauropsids that weren't anapsids. But, more recent studies have placed Diapsids within the larger clade Eureptilia, since amniotes like Captorhinus aren't members of Diapsida. Within Diapsida, there are a number of basal members, such as Petrolacosaurus, that look superficially similar to modern lizards, however they are only distantly related. Dinosaurs, as well as modern crocodiles, lizards, and snakes, are contained within the clade Sauria, which split approximately 300 million years ago into Lepidosauromorpha and Archosauromorpha. The Lepidosauromorphs are the lizards and snakes, but again, we aren't here to talk about them. Within Archosauromorpha is the clade Archosauria, which began with creatures like Euparcaria, survivors of the end Permian mass extinction 250 million years ago, and the ancestors of both crocs and ducks, but no crocoduck. This clade is defined by having two pairs of additional openings, antorbital fenestra in the skull just in front of the eye sockets, and mandibular fenestra in the lower jaw. These additional openings made the skull lighter and allowed for more muscle attachments and a stronger bite. But research also shows that the antorbital fenestra likely supported a pneumatic sinus that aided in breathing. Archosaurs also have teeth set in sockets and a fourth trochanter, which is a ridge on the femur. This was an attachment site for muscles that pulled the leg backwards, allowing them to run very fast. It also facilitated facultative bipedality in some archosaurs, which will become important later on. 
Archosauria then splits into a number of lineages, including Pseudosuchia. We talked about these in Stasis and Ava Metatarsalia. The latter group is what we're interested in and is characterized by having a very different ankle joint compared to the Pseudosuchians and other archosaurs. Pseudosuchians have a crurotarsal ankle with a ball socket-like joint between the astragalus and calcineum that causes the feet to swivel outwards while walking. Ava metatarsalians have an advanced mesotarsal ankle with a large astragalus, small calcineum, and a simple hinge joint between the metatarsals and the former two bones. This configuration only allows the joint to move forward or backward, which is more compatible with locomotion while the limbs are held in a vertical position. As a result, members of Ava metatarsalia lost the sprawling gait and began to walk more upright. Within Ava metatarsalia, the tree splits into Aphanosauria, a clade of quadrupeds containing some surprisingly large members like Teleocrater and Ornithodira. The first clade to branch off within Ornithodira is the Pterosaurs. These appeared in the Triassic and share some similarities with the small Scleromachlis. Pterosaurs greatly radiated throughout the Mesozoic, including some members with huge crests like Tupandactylus, but they were wiped out during the Cretaceous extinction. Recent work has even homed in on the genes involved in the formation of their wings, another step forward on the paleogenomic experimental reconstruction of the dynamics of ancient life. After the pterosaurs branched off, the remaining archosaurs are grouped into the clade Dinosauromorpha. The earliest of these found so far is actually a set of footprints from early Triassic Poland, belonging to the Ichnogenus Prorhododactylus. Slightly closer to the dinosaurs are the Loggerpedids, a group of small, bipedal dinosauromorphs. These look very much like dinosaurs on the outside, and they are indeed very close, as the name indicates. However, dinosaurs are defined as having an open acetabulum, which is an open hip socket wherein the head of the femur is inserted. This caused dinosaurs to walk in an even more upright posture. Like the pterosaurs, these early dinosauromorphs have a closed acetabulum, but they share more skeletal features with the true dinosaurs. After them, the remaining dinosauromorphs are grouped into dinosauriformes, who have either a partially or fully open acetabulum. Inching closer to the origin of dinosaurs is the small biped Marasuchus. Like dinosaurs, it has an elongate pubis. And sister to the dinosaurs is the family Silosauridae. This clade includes some quadrupeds, like Silosaurus, and some bipeds like the ironically named Eucelophysis. Its name means true Coelophysis, even though it's not a Coelophysoid, a theropod, or even a dinosaur. Some Silosaurids reached fairly large sizes, larger than the earliest dinosaurs, as indicated by specimen NHMUKR16303, which may be a species of Acylosaurus. One common feature of so many of these basal dinosaur morphs is their bipedality, suggesting upright posture and freed forelimbs might have had some selective advantage against being on all fours. And when we do find the first dinosaurs, who appeared approximately 235 million years ago, the Middle Triassic, they are all small bipedal creatures. Middle to late Triassic dinosaurs include the herbivores such as Lesothosaurus, Eocursor, and Pisanosaurus, Omnivores such as Eoraptor, and carnivores such as Demonosaurus, Eodromius, Buriolestes, and Herrerasaurus. They all look very similar to each other, and you might be forgiven for mistaking them all for mere bipedal theropods, but they are not. While Demonosaurus and Eodromius are considered to be close relatives of theropods, Lesothosaurus, Eocursor, and Pisanosaurus are actually basal ornithischians a clade which includes Triceratops, Stegosaurus, and Iguanodon. The omnivorous Eoraptor and carnivorous Buriolestes are sauropodomorphs, and Herrerasaurus is also considered to be closely related to this lineage, leading to the world's largest terrestrial herbivores. It might seem odd to consider bipedal dinosaurs as close relatives of quadrupedal sauropods, but we already knew that bipedality was the ancestral condition as it is seen with the sauropod morph Platyosaurus. Although it should be stated that the exact position of some of these early dinosaurs is still hotly debated among researchers. Herrerasaurus in particular exhibits a mixture of ancestral and derived traits, and was previously considered to be a basal theropod or a basal saurischian. In a recent study, Andrea Coe considers Herrerasaurus as basal to all other dinosaurs, 
and also says that the basal Ornithischian pisanosaurus is not a true dinosaur, but a Silosaurid. In 2017, Baron et al. published their controversial paper proposing the clade Ornithoskeleta, sparking a new discussion among researchers where they theorized whether the three dinosaur lineages, Sauropodomorpha, Ornithischia, and Theropoda, split during the Middle Triassic where the Sauropodomorphs are the most basal. It is difficult to determine the exact relationships of these early Triassic dinosaurs because, at that time, they recently diverged from each other and as a result they have few distinctive features. Comparing these basal members of Sauropodomorphs, Ornithischians, and Theropods is not at all like comparing Diplodocus, Triceratops, and T-Rex. It's more like comparing modern cats to each other. But you only have at the very best partial skeletons of a limited number of species. Figuring out close phylogeny with just that is tough work. However, this is to be expected from how evolution works. Transitions don't happen in big, discrete steps. While we like to make clear-cut distinctions between groups with cladistics, at such relatively small timescales, morphological distinctions become very fuzzy. A quick recap. As we went through the ancestral phylogeny, we have defined dinosaurs as amniotes that have two temporal, one antorbital, and one mandibular fenestra, in addition to having teeth set in sockets, a fourth trochanter, an advanced metatarsal ankle joint, and an open acetabulum. Although some groups within dinosaurs have lost some of these characteristics, such as birds, which lack teeth, and some avian dinosaurs have closed their acetabulum. So, we should follow the principle of monophyly and define dinosaurs as a group of organisms sharing one common ancestor that exhibits all of these traits plus all its descendants, which may or may not have lost some of them. And we have also seen some of the earliest dinosaurs and their closer relatives from the Triassic period, starting out as seemingly insignificant small bipedal creatures before they diversified into endless forms that took over the world from the biggest of all terrestrial animals that ever lived to the songbirds in your backyard. And that's where I'm going to end this video. In the next one, we're going to look at the first of three lineages of dinosaurs, the sauropodomorphs. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.